a very warm welcome to the 168th Security Thought Leadership Webinar. 168. And every Thursdays in the afternoon, we're here at this time where we discuss a topic of importance to the security sector. And one of the interesting things that's happened over time is that in the olden days, it all used to be about being live. But now this goes on the website tomorrow and people all over the world follow it afterwards from universities to those interested in thought leadership. And the idea of thought leadership is that we critique today in order that we have a better understanding of the issues to get a better type of security tomorrow. And uh, as always, we choose a topic that's in the news. And today, what could not be more in the news all over the world is the implications of the Russian-Ukraine war on the private security sector. And um, I, we've got with me three, three experts in this area, three fairly renowned experts, actually, uh, all of whom have been involved in thought leadership, all of whom are very well known on the circuit. And in a minute, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. And once they've done that, I'll ask each of them for their opening statement. And then if you've got a question, please do use the question answer button at the bottom of your screen. And I'll endeavour to include you in the ensuing discussion. Um, uh, clearly a topic right at the forefront where there's a lot of uh, news going on, but what's the thinking behind it in terms of the implication on the security sector? Without further ado then, let's go and meet our panel and uh, um, excited again to introduce them to you. First of all, Ewan. Ewan, can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, going ahead, uh, Ewan Grant, the former strategic intelligence analyst for the ex-Soviet states and the expansion EU states in the old UK Customs Service, uh, subsequently worked as a contractor for EU programs in Ukraine several times, Moldova, but also in the Middle East and West and East Africa, where you see already the spillovers over many years from ex-Soviet states, and we will see more of that in the years to come. Ewan, thank you very much indeed. And Thomas, over to you. Please introduce yourself, Thomas. Thank you, Martin. Uh, my name is Tom Bonier. I am an architect. I'm also a certified protection professional. I've uh, worked in Ukraine and Russia both um, prior to the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, in Ukraine, I worked on hospitality facilities, some industrial facilities, and some retail facilities. I've worked all over the world as an architect uh, in security, uh, mainly for physical security, but also technical security for U.S. embassies. And I've been in Russia uh, quite a bit over the years uh, for various projects. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, um, our final panelist, for those of you in this part of the world where I live in, in, in Britain, will have seen this man on the news quite a bit talking about this very topic. Philip, over to you. Please introduce yourself. Thank you very much indeed, Martin, and, and good to uh, be on this with everyone. Um, Philip Ingram, I'm a former senior British military intelligence officer and NATO planner. Uh, one of the things about Ukraine is, um, you know, in NATO terms, I've planned parts of NATO's defences along uh, its eastern border, and some of the formations that have attacked into Ukraine, uh, we'd actually planned our defences against them. Uh, I'm now a journalist, and as Martin said, I do a lot of commentary on defence matters security matters, counterintelligence, cyber, um, and, and other things. So I keep popping up, not just on British television, on, on, on TV across the globe. So in, in the last sort of month or six weeks, it's been uh, the UK, the Middle East, and Australia. Um, uh, and I usually then pop up in the United States, Canada, and um, I've even done Japan, which is interesting. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much indeed, panel. Once again, Right, we've uh, managed to attract world's leading experts in this subject area. I'm now going to ask each of them to, for their opening statement, three minutes when they get to choose whatever they want to speak about this subject area to see it from their form of expertise. Don't forget, if you'd like to ask a question, do get it in early. Use the question answer button at the bottom of your screen and we'll look to include it when we go to the discussion afterwards. Without further ado, Ewan, your opening statement, please. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, time short, so this will be very much seeding bullet points for the Q&A. Um, dealing with the consequences of the war, and indeed, as um, Philip and Thomas have pointed out, long since before the war, you need to have a broad church approach, scrap demarcation, silos go out of the window, law enforcement, where I come from, and I define that widely, you have to think in a semi-military sense, 
because the Soviet Union was an armed camp, hence the need for people like Philip. And the UK, and particularly the Western European countries, because of certain attitude hang-ups, and also the Eastern European, Central European countries, because of resource shortage, it's not an attitude issue there, you need to involve the US and Canada. So it's great that Thomas is here. Um, Ukraine is a strategic country. You have to think of all the consequences spinning over, indeed worldwide, but certainly west and south. Um, particular immediate issues, refugees, the need if private security gets involved in protection of refugees, supporting border agencies, you need to be as tight as a lid, strict discipline, strict self-discipline. You are dealing with a possible spin-off of major criminals, but also people who are desperate and honest people who may be tempted. And above all, in Ukraine, the very serious issue of trafficking for sexual purposes and abuse of refugees. And you need to be on alert for that all the time. And I would just add very quickly, anybody working in Africa or the Middle East, we need to look at the consequences, which currently are probably shrinking, but will expand when the war goes into the negotiation phase that Philip mentioned, maybe this autumn, late summer, um, is the whole saga of things like the Wagner mercenary group who turn up wherever there are mining and oil and gas contracts in a large number of countries, mainly in Africa, but not necessarily just in Africa, also in South America. Security guards, um, line of communication, supply chain protectors, that kind of thing. Broad Church, look forward to hearing everybody's comments. Thank you very much indeed, Ewan. And don't forget, if you'd like to get a question, please use the question and answer thing at your bottom of the uh, screen. And um, we've had questions in, in advance, actually, so um, um, I'll incorporate those as well. Tom, your opening statement, please. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to speak from the perspective of someone who works on facilities. And um, I think, you know, we're facing the full range of challenges to security as you'd face, let's say, in widespread civil unrest, only much worse. And it's all types of facilities. Uh, there's a particular focus now on cultural properties and museums and places that have artifacts of value, uh, but also um, any retail establishment, any hospitality establishment, any establishment that is involved in manufacture faces all sorts of uh, unprecedented security challenges now. Um, coupled with that uh, set of threats is the fact that most able-bodied men um, are being called into service and they're not really available to act in the private security sector in the numbers and in the character that perhaps would have been the case beforehand. So uh, while you have these threats of looting and stealing, of um, deliberate targeting of cultural assets and collateral damage from indiscriminate artillery firing and bombing, you have uh, this diminished availability of people who can protect sites. And so this is a, a kind of a perfect storm in terms of um, what, what is happening, uh, particularly to uh, properties that are on the protected list by UNESCO. You may know that there is a, a Hague Treaty from 1954 to which all parties involved in this, including Belarus, are signatories uh, that prohibit the deliberate targeting of, of cultural properties and cultural symbols. Um, and UNESCO itself has announced that something on the order of 160 such properties have already suffered damage. The International Council of Museums has warned about the threat of looting, and um, that comes from all sorts of sources. I think, as Ewan mentioned, people who might be tempted to do something out of desperation but wouldn't otherwise. Uh, so there's many, many factors at play here, and I hope we'll be able to explore some of the ways to cope with them. 
Tom, thank you very much indeed. Do you know that was a really uh, another interesting take on uh, um, something that hasn't really been at the forefront, but clearly crucial stuff. I'll definitely come back to that in a minute as well. Um, and don't forget to get your questions in early on the question and action button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll incorporate those if we can. That's after, though, we've heard from our third panelist. Philip, your opening statement, please. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. Well, I'm going to come at things from a slightly different angle again. Let's look at pre-conflict. Ukraine, the second largest landmass in Europe. Um, however, what did, why did Zelensky get a non-politician get elected to be president? He got elected on an anti-corruption stance because there was an awful lot of corruption throughout business within Ukraine. Uh, and if we look at things from a serious and organized crime perspective and a cyber perspective, Ukraine was a center of a lot of activity being focused out into the rest of Europe. That still underpins and that still exists within the fabric of the society that's there pre-conflict. The individuals that were involved in it um, are now focused on uh, fighting the Russians on the front line rather than carrying out the criminal activities elsewhere. However, the opportunities for those criminal organizations to exploit what's happening is huge. We've got huge numbers of resources coming in um, the, through international aid uh, and through informal aid from, from suppliers. There are already indications of weapon systems being supplied by the West, being advertised for sale on the dark web. Um, and uh, you know, that's an indication of what's potentially going on there and the potential threats that that gives out to the rest of the world. During the conflict, what have we got? We've got the biggest soup of um, uncontrolled explosives, weapons and ammunition being thrown all over the countryside with people um, in white vans, other colours are available, driving from all across Europe with the, uh, the, the best intentions to deliver aid. But we don't know who's in those vans. We don't know who's controlling them. We don't know where they're coming from. And then they're going back to their home countries again. You can drive from Birmingham, where I live in the UK, to Ukraine in a day and a half and, and back again. Um, so what am I going to bring back in my van and what's the implications of that from a security perspective with this uncontrolled um, uh, uh, explosives, weapons and ammunition? And of course, the people that are coming through and has been mentioned earlier, the people trafficking and we're already getting reports of serious and organised criminal gangs trying to traffic um, women and children um, uh, across different borders for their own nefarious purposes, um, which is absolutely appalling. So you'll get the corruption from the business that's going in and the money that's going in. There's the potential terrorist threat um, and exploitation by serious and organized criminals of the weapons that are available. And we're already seeing exploitation um, of, of the people that are coming through. So Ukraine as is at the moment um, is a, a melting pot for a lot of potential threats that are only going to start to manifest themselves over time um, as, the, as the conflict starts to ease off. There are other threats that will stimulate. Um, it's one of the biggest food suppliers, especially into uh, third world countries around the world with grain um, and cooking oil and, and other substances. Um, as that supply gets um, impacted, then uh, within those different countries, we're going to see increases in uh, people migrating for um, economic purposes, uh, in potential starvation and causing famine. Um, and uh, therefore, that will impact potentially on the security, the private security industry that is uh, involved in those sorts of areas. And of course, we have the private security industry, um, both directly and indirectly involved inside Ukraine. Um, you know, I, and, and the quality of the the uh, support that's been provided is very variable. Uh, a friend of mine is a senior journalist with um, a, a major international press outlet um, and she was in eastern Ukraine and her um, uh, organization insisted that every single member in the team carried with them a GPS transmitter and they didn't understand, the security teams didn't understand why that was a bad idea. Uh, given that the Russian electronic warfare is targeting in on uh, and can identify uh, locations of GPS transmitters. And they haven't been given simple advice uh, like to change the SIMs on their phones from international SIMs to local SIMs and things like that. So we're getting a lot of um, individuals going in to provide security support to those that are going in, either as journalists or aid suppliers or otherwise, who are not necessarily knowledgeable in what they're doing and are potentially increasing the threat that's there. And that's something as an industry and from an industry reputational perspective, we should be very concerned about. Martin. Thank you, wow. Uh, um, um, normally when we have these webinars, we get there and I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm gonna focus on this issue. It's almost, where do we start? <laughs> Thomas, I think I'm gonna start with what you've raised because um, given what you and, and Philip were saying there and the scale of these other problems, 
I just wonder what the process is of getting thinking on the sorts of subjects that you're talking about, because there's a, a sense in which it's very important. It's got all the sort of right issues that in normal times would be a high priority. Suddenly, is there a danger we're going to be thinking trafficking, terrorism, children exploitation? Uh, my goodness, uh, um, how do you get a focus on this? No, there's no question about it. I, I think these are um, issues that take a back seat to the fundamental conflict and, and who's winning the battles and who's, who's going to win the war. Um, what I see these issues doing primarily is garnering additional support um, for Ukraine and for protection of Ukraine's assets and for uh, condemnation of the Russian Federation for its invasion. Um, I think we have to make a distinction uh, probably between what I would say is private security and what I would call mercenary forces or uh, people who are interested in combat. Um, and I think you have both uh, and then some present in the region. Um, I, there have been a number of cases already of people um, being extracted um, by military teams, um, either they, because they've been kidnapped or because uh, they haven't been able to extricate themselves from combat zones. And so there's a, there's a fairly active business uh, going right now in that area. And I, I think um, we have to also recognize that this is spilling over into Romania, Hungary, Poland, uh, the, the Baltic republics, anyone who's more or less adjacent to the Belarus and to uh, Ukraine is, is feeling the impacts in a major way. And uh, that, that for, for uh, private security and facilities, it means more pressure on commercial properties of various kinds. Uh, but it also means uh, probably uh, efforts to help uh, protect those cultural assets that have been moved out of the country, and some of them have. Uh, so it, I think you're right, Martin, it's very hard to, to put this higher on the list when you have so many other issues and especially the humanitarian crisis that uh, is already underway and looms larger. Uh, I think that's a hard, hard thing to reconcile. Well, let me just get a comment from you and Anne from Philip on this one, because you and you first, you, you obviously raised a whole range of quite dynamic issues. Just on this very specific issue about the cultural heritage, which in the long run is gonna be very, very important, of course, when people reflect on this. And this, these, these broader issues, they do matter, of course. Do you sense any sort of uh, um, importance to focus on it? Is it just unrealistic? Where would you put that in the great scheme of uh, um, uh, getting, getting recognition for the issue in these troubled times, where they're very troubled times? You have just a brief comment, you wouldn't mind a brief comment from Philip as well. You and first. I'd put it pretty high up. Um, but even if I didn't, I would say, look at one thing and you will find other things. So it stands high in its own right. It stands high for what it will also reveal. As I mentioned earlier, you just simply have to knock away the silos. And if you find the people in charge of support, investigation, um, deterrence, on top to it, you have to bring in new people. You have to overmanage these. You have to have enough people who can pick up the pieces and join them up. No, this is a big issue. The cultural issue, the church issues, was a not insignificant factor in raising tensions. Okay, this thank you. Big stuff. Okay, Philip, just from you, I mean, because uh, you've raised a yeah, whole I, range of issues. I, I, th I think, I think the, the cultural side of things within Ukraine is at the heart of the matter. You know, Putin does not believe Ukraine should be an independent country and that the people are separate from um, uh, the Russians. And he's described them as little Russians, um, not because he sees them as uh, just uh, part of the Russian society and all the rest of it, but he, he's meant it as a demeaning term as well to suggest that they don't uh, deserve their own um, identity and their own culture. 
and therefore it's part of Russia's active campaign to target cultural sites to destroy them because they want to destroy um, any history and heritage that the Ukrainian people have got. Uh, and again, this shows a wider piece that you know, from a private security perspective, we need to be we need to be aware of both in this conflict and future conflicts. He's showing a complete scant disregard for um, international norms, for international the international rule of law, um, for um, the rules based society that we live in. Um, and therefore, any of the protections that we think that we can rely on um, from in, an international law perspective, anything that's in there, forget it. You know, the gloves are off. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. And therefore, we have to look at things from that wider threat perspective. So protecting the Ukrainian culture is protecting their culture, uh, uh, is, is protecting their culture and is attacking the heart of what Putin is trying to do. So you know, from, a, from a conflict perspective, it's very important indeed. Interesting. Interesting. OK, thank you very much indeed. And uh, I mean, we may well sort of come back to that. Let me I'm going to stick with you, Philip, if I might. And a question from the audience. Uh, in fact, we had a couple uh, um, in advance about human rights. So let me read out the one that's here. Uh, and Philip, what happens to human rights and due diligence on private security providers in these situations like Ukraine? Uh, um, uh, and what is the what are the dangers of uh, not taking this seriously. So it's more about very specifically with regards to the private security sector. You seem a good person to ask on this to start with. It's, it's a very gray area in law because you know, private security operatives, and I'll, I'll put them completely separate as, as Thomas said, from those that are in fighting in the foreign legion formations with the Ukrainian military. Um, um, I, I will sort of bring in the Wagner group into it um, uh, because they, they highlight the extreme end of one side of private security and inverted commas, but then through to the other side, in that the human rights um, really, you know, it, it comes down to the application of national law um, within the country. So, so private security companies that are operating inside Ukraine uh, must comply with Ukrainian national law. And, and the Ukrainians are um, big on human rights. You know, they they um, you do uh, follow a lot of the European conventions because they're, 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 they've been applying or trying to get into position to uh, apply for um, EU membership. And you know, hopefully this afternoon um, with Schultz and Macron um, visiting or, or not long after, there'll be um, a, an acceptance of Ukraine uh, or a, a more formal acceptance of Ukraine's and recognition of Ukraine's application to join the EU. So human rights within country is, is, is not bad. Um, it's former Soviet, so you know, not bad. It has to be taken with a pinch of salt, mm -hmm. um, but it's 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 improving. However, when you get into the disputed areas, you know, the dis disputed Donbass region and the so-called breakaway states and the private security companies with the Wagner Group in particular that are in there, human rights it, it doesn't matter. You know, the, yeah. the human being is not considered important, um, and therefore, you know, the, the, from their perspective, the gloves are off, and, and they're committing international crimes, um, and you know, will set themselves up in the same way that when human rights was violated in the wars in Yugoslavia, um, international criminal tribunals will come and get people in the future. Um, and interestingly, the Ukrainians, along with uh, the international criminal courts, are currently carrying out active investigations and have already started the evidence gathering process uh, to look at violations of human rights and, and other war crimes as well. So, you know, it's uh, you know, in effect, national laws inside Ukraine, if that's where you're operating, national laws inside the countries bounding Ukraine, uh, but then we get into, you know, the, the laws of armed conflict when it comes into the disputed zones. Ewan, let me come to you on this issue. Um, human rights, your thoughts, Ewan? Well, I, I would really just completely um, repeat what um, Philip said. Um, you, you can completely forget international law in the occupied territories. Um, people have to realise that uh, you may find in the years to come, some of these people will venture to other countries. Um, they may be able to be picked up. Not every country, countries like the UAE, for instance, will not enforce international warrants. We One dark shadow we have to be aware about, we have to handle very carefully, firmly but carefully, is hostage taking. We need to look at the ultimate fate of the captured British military personnel. There may well be security people who drift over a line and get caught. And we've just heard of a number of Americans. Um, as you know, the Brits are facing the death penalty uh, from the so-called separatist republics. Russia careful not to apply it itself. Um, 
this is serious stuff and we have to be prepared um, for hostage taking, uh, whether people have done anything wrong or not. There's going to have to be swaps. There's going to have to be hard deals. That means a lot of bad people will get away with it. Uh, Finney, just want to come on briefly before I come. Yeah, I just, I just want to come back very, very quickly and, and just correct you on slightly. The the individuals that have been captured are not British military personnel. They're Ukrainian military personnel um, who just happen to be British passport holders yeah, who, yeah, who have joined taken. the Ukrainian military before the conflict had happened. They're living in Ukraine with their families and all the rest of it. But no British military personnel, and there are two um, Americans in the same position. Um, yeah, they're, they're yeah. not British military personnel. Who've, I, who've I should have country. said citizens. Yes, they're yeah, not. And, and, they are not serving. Uh, uh, and you, you, they're they're being used against international law, against the Geneva Conventions, because they are legitimate um, combat personnel. But again, if there are British military personnel or U.S. military personnel, and you know there will be some uh, in country who are accompanying our, our leaders that go in, um, and uh, you know there, there there may be some that are slightly naive and go absent without leave from their different organizations uh, and go in and try and join up. If they do get captured, then we have to recognize that they will be used as, as political pawns, as we've seen the, the individuals that have been captured so far um, are, are doing so. Um, and that's what they are. They're political pawns. The advantage of that is they're better currency for Vladimir Putin when they're alive, not when they're dead. Hmm. Nasty. Stuff. Coming back to the uh, coming back to the cultural question for a moment, um, we may well see prosecutions emerge for destruction of cultural properties, and yeah. the seven uh, World Heritage sites, uh, UNESCO World Heritage sites that are in Ukraine, are clearly threatened. Uh, beyond all the legal implications that are involved, I think it should be recognized that. These become symbols of, of uh, uh, destruction that are very hard to reconcile over time. And they're la just as the loss of a human being and a family is something that uh, really never heals, um, you could say that some of these cultural properties, if they're destroyed or damaged severely, that wound is very hard to heal over time. Um, I, we saw that certainly in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and uh, I, I think both in um, Sarajevo and in Belgrade, there are lasting symbols um, of, of hatred and conflict that uh, won't die until the people who were alive when it happened pass away. And even then um, it, it endures. So I think these are important symbols uh, and, and add a dimension to the human tragedy and the human loss. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's absolutely. It's it's uh, um, the issue is the issue is more about how you get a focus in these times. But you've you've all given me some insights on that. Let me move on. I got a question. You and I'll come to you first. Uh, William Deal, he's asked an interesting. Also, by the way, we had a question in advance about this one as well. Out of interest, but let me go to William Deal's question about um, um, uh, Russian Eastern oligarchs. Uh, uh, and what what happens next, Ewan, with these people? Because um, they're in a way a symbol, right? They're a symbol in the West of this regime, and uh, there they've been uh, um, they've been they've been hit around the world with sanctions. Uh, uh, what next, Ewan, with them? An awful lot of patience is the answer, because different countries will have different results. Um, maximum inconvenience to them, real fear of ultimately losing their asset. Remember at the moment, um, the great majority of assets are frozen. They're not confiscated. Um, the aim must be to keep the pressure up and try and get some of them to break and perhaps help the West. Um, uh, certainly some of them can give a lot of information. Not many will because they've still got family in Russia. Um, we need to be prepared for a long, long haul. And we need to have a much better debate about what the results are. This is diplomatic pressure. It's applied for diplomatic and political reasons. It is not primarily to deprive them of their wealth. Hmm. I mean, does it matter? I mean, I mean, the point that I'm trying to get to is that that this is about uh, uh, um, this is 
to what extent does hitting them serve as a symbol that something in the West is taking place that is meaningful, a symbol of action? I mean, is it going to make any real difference at the end of the day? I mean, I guess that's the that's the point. Philip, you're saying, yes, it will. Carry on. It, it'll make a huge difference. You know, the, the, the sanctions of the oligarch are, are one weapon system, um, and we're using weapon systems across the board, whether they be diplomatic, political, economic, uh, military, or, or everything else. Um, and it's a very long-term, long-effect weapon system. Um, uh, and if, if you look at the way businesses um, split up in Russia, the oligarchs own everything. You know, they're, they're, there's oligarchs that are deal with the manufacturing, uh, a group of them. There's oligarchs that deal with everything retail. There's oligarchs that deal with everything natural resources. Um, uh, and, and they all work together. Um, and they're allowed to operate because the central master oligarch, the king of the oligarchs, is um, Vladimir Putin. Um, and his, he, you know, he runs a political oligarchy that uh, enables them to carry out their activities um, and fix their prices and tax, uh, uh, avoid their taxes and, and maintain their wealth. And the price for that is to launder Vladimir Putin's money and act as Putin's bankers. So effectively, we're attacking Putin directly by freezing their assets overseas. Um, and that will start to have an impact on um, you know, them personally because they're used to very luxurious lifestyles. But even after the fighting war stops, and even if there's a diplomatic settlement or an interim diplomatic settlement, you know, the oligarchs and the pressure on them gives us the ability to continue putting pressure on Vladimir Putin, Putin's regime, um, and you know, the, the, the whole of the Russian state until there is a final outcome that is satisfactory, first and foremost, to the people of Ukraine, and then secondly, to the wider international community. And this is where the resolve of the international community coming together um, uh, in, in working against the oligarchs has been significant and it's important that that continues. The final piece I'll say on that is that it's also saying, uh, sending another message to another organization or, or group that is sitting watching very closely what's going on, and that's China. Um, and you know, the economic pressure and the way we um, attacked the economic centre of Russia through the oligarchs very quickly is something that will have meant Xi Jinping will have sat there and gone, my military plans to take over Taiwan, commanders, please give me the files back. I'm putting them back on the shelf for a few years. Wow. OK. Uh, um, interesting. And um, uh, Tom, I wonder whether you, you raised the issue about cultural points. I mean, is there any link here behind treatment of the oligarchs and getting at these issues that way or is that just too far-fetched to imagine it being possible well i haven't really contemplated that no, I, I will say this yeah i will say this that when um uh, let's say a, a 19 million dollar yacht is seized in a port in spain and uh, the promise is made that the proceeds from the sale of that yacht will go toward helping ukrainian refugees that has enormous uh, sort of public relations impact. It, it has value in that sense. And I think it gives people perhaps a false sense that something significant has been done. Um, I, I do think that the tourism industry and to the degree that, that Moscow had a thriving luxury goods business and, and a sort of a link with the luxury uh, products of the world, all, all of that has, has contracted now and is disappearing. And those people who profited from those enterprises probably aren't enjoying um, conditions they had come to enjoy in the past. And that too will take its toll. And I, I think the sanctions on uh, Russia that, that um, diminish its ability to derive revenues from foreign sources is uh, they're, they're extremely valuable and that has to be on all fronts. And I think tourism is one of those areas where uh, more can be done and will be done. Yeah. OK, thank you very much indeed. I want to move on, if I can, to ask you each of a question about the private security sector and how 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 it's being perceived. I mean, just to give you a clue, I was at uh, a European conference last month. And uh, Ukraine were out in force, actually. The Ukraine private security sector were there. I say in force, there were seven or eight uh, um, showing up to make a point that, you know, they're back in action. 
Uh, as you say, uh, uh, you and, and earlier on, they're all involved in uh, um, fighting the war. So this was a release to come and, and show strength. I'm putting a very positive image of um, um, Ukrainian private security sector overall. Philip, you were a little bit more thoughtful about the context in which uh, um, the background to all that. Do you think the private security sector is going to come out of this uh, uh, in a more positive light um, or... or are we looking at uh, um, some, <laughs> well, what, what light is it going to come out in? Philip, your thoughts first. I don't think there's enough evidence at the moment to see where the private security sector is is helping you know, inside Ukraine itself and, and the activities that are going on. It'll be very interesting to see you know, the, the um, reports that are coming out from some of the uh, the international organisations. And, uh, you know, I, I understand that the ACES chapter in Kiev uh, is still meeting. Um, yeah. Whether whether it be virtually, um, and you know, I understand uh, you know, Asus UK have helped deliver some aid capabilities through Asus um, in Kiev, uh, and it's fantastic to see that you know, the international organisations uh, keeping the norms of the private security um, uh, arena are, are are still going in the same way. I think um, what it'll do is it will improve um, the relationships that there are between the private security sector in Ukraine and. Um, the international private security sector, because you know, are, are by the very nature of what's happening and the horrors that are going on, um, you know, that that is opening up the compassion that there is across um, every sector of business, uh, and security will benefit from that. Um, it, as as Ukraine comes into Europe again, there'll be the greater links between the private security sector um, in Ukraine and and into Europe. And as legislation starts to come online, you know, there, there's the ability for them to give us a better understanding of operating in a very high threat environment um, with um, everything that's going on, and us to then help bring um, uh, them into a, a more legislative um, uh, or an increasing legislative private security environment. Um, that, that, that's happening. But particular lessons for the private security industry that are coming out of it at the moment, I think it's too early. Yeah, I mean, you're right about you're right about uh, the ASIS chapter. Incidentally, I, I was due to give a talk at uh, their first meeting after the war started, uh, a chapter meeting. Incredible just coincidence. And they wrote to me to say, sorry, we can't have you, but we're a bit tied up. But we'll get you at the first. Um, we'll get you to speak at the very first meeting we can when we've won the war. You know, it's an amazing sort of a. Uh, um, but they're, you're, they're meeting virtually, as you say. Yeah. Uh, you and let me come to you because in your opening statement, I just want to uh, get a bit more detail. You were talking about some of the implications on the private security sector beyond Ukraine, uh, uh, and some of the sort of challenges. And, uh, uh, and I'm going to come to Thomas in a minute, who's mentioned specifically in the cultural sector. And I wonder whether the security sector beyond Ukraine, outside, is really up to and understanding the types of threats that are coming its way and is skilled enough and adept enough to adapt to them in a meaningful response. Um, in the theory, you'd hope so. Uh, uh, Ewan, what, what's your thoughts on that? No, it isn't. Ah, carry on. <laughs> it, needs, it needs to build. It needs to work hard. It needs, as I mentioned earlier, to overmanage in the European region and indeed to a certain extent among European companies working world, worldwide, particularly overstretched French companies in Africa. You have to have more people like Philip um, at all ranks. And you also need to have close links with the US organizations like Thomas's um, and you have to recognize that there will be misconduct among certain Ukrainian security companies and Ukrainians working for other companies that has to be accepted it will be inevitable Philip why, mentioned why, the corruption. why 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 um, it, it, it will just be inevitable. Some will be have been under great stress. Ah. Um, there will also be dodgy individuals who will slip through um, because vetting checks will have been skipped or will have inevitably been unreliable. You have to build it in and work very hard. So it requires tip-top management at all times, working with governments and working with regional and international organizations. And I would particularly urge attention to much of South America, where Ukraine can provide a lot of information. This help 
and sometimes it will be hindrance, bad, bad things. But this help should be recognized diplomatically that at one step removed, it is Ukraine helping the West for years to come. And that has to be repaid with compound interest with the West helping Ukraine. They will pick up on Wagner and, and indeed um, the potential Chinese equivalents of Wagner. OK, thank you very much. Thomas, in your specific area, here's a good point. How hopeful are you the security sector is equipped to um, uh, uh, meet the challenges that you and others on this webinar have spoken about? And the point is, though, Thomas, when I say how, uh, how hopeful, I mean, how realistic is it that it's geared up and ready and able? I think um, I would go back to uh, what Philip said about compassion. I think it is widespread, um, certainly in Europe, and I think you see evidence of that across all professions, as Philip said. I know in my own profession, architecture, great accommodations are being made to try and welcome principally female architects who have fled Ukraine, to have them work uh, in the western part of Europe in safety. And the fatigue that you might expect, uh, the sort of um, refugee fatigue, has not set in uh, for a number of reasons. But uh, first and foremost, I think it's because these people still hold out the hope uh, and, and the belief that they're going to return to Ukraine and soon. And as long as that hope's alive, I think the prospects are very good. So that compassion and that sharing professionally will spread into the private security sector. And I think uh, you will see um, a solidarity of action uh, when the fighting ceases, uh, uh, by whatever means it ceases. I think you will see uh, uh, much more cooperation and, and much more interchange between uh, private security forces in the West and, and those uh, in, in Ukraine. And um, there will be jobs for them to do, that's for sure. And I think this point of compassion and, and uh, sharing is one that we all have to look toward uh, as a hopeful set of signs. Yeah, just on this very specific issue that you've been raising about, this, uh, this cultural issue. because I do think it's very, very, very important. I share with you the concern, partly because it's not in the spotlight for obvious reasons. Um, um, just reassure us. I mean, uh, in your... Well, you, you know, Martin, it is in the spotlight. Uh, there, there's okay. quite a cultural industry across the globe. There's quite a community of people who uh, place great value in heritage sites, in pieces of history that have been built uh, by human beings. And uh, those people have kind of rallied themselves to support and, and to criticize and, and to try and help in any way they can. It's not inconsiderable, and it certainly is not uh, something that's on the front burner for news media, but um, I do think it's an important force and, and one that um, will have an increasingly important voice as, as we, uh, I hope, progress toward a settlement of some kind. Panel, thank you so much. Uh, we could go on. I would love to go on, actually. I was, uh, um, um, so much is going on in this area. So many unknowns, so many things to consider. Thank you so much indeed for your, uh, um, for your comments. And obviously I'm sure it's a topic we're gonna have to come back to at some future point. Um, uh, I learned a lot from, from that webinar. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for the questions. I thank you for the questions I got in advance, by the way. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get through them all, but uh, um, uh, we're running out of time. Let me just go quickly to um, a few final points, if I might, just to say that um, OSPA entries are still open, but they're gonna close in the US on the 5th of July. Benelux on the 11th of July, Canada the first one ever on the 18th of July. And don't forget there's some events in August that uh, uh, are gonna close, the Tekkers, the Cyber Ospers, the South Africa Ospers and the German Ospers. So get your entries in early if you're in those parts of the world. Um, also to say that we're back with two more before we take a summer break. So there's two more webinars and we're not here in July and August. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at Pride. It's Pride Month, and we're going to be looking at uh, inclusivity and uh, uh, the importance of allies. This is not a topic that's very much discussed uh, in the private security sector. Another one that's been under the radar. But this community has been uh, active, and uh, we're going to be looking at the issues um, and facing out how the security is responding uh, and uh, what the issues are and how they might be taken forward. Good subject for thought leadership. So do please join me next Thursday. 
uh, at the same time. Uh, uh, well, we'll be looking at that. The second to last one uh, before we uh, take a, a break in July and August. So just one final thing for me to thank my panel once again for their input. Uh, um, remember to tell you all that a copy of the webinar will be on the website tomorrow with a blog that uh, will be covering many of these issues. Uh, thank you very much indeed, panel. Thank you very much indeed, audience. Hopefully see you next Thursday. Until we thank meet you, everyone. Thank you, Philip. Wherever you are in the world. Thank you, Martin. Stay safe. Take care. Thank you all. Great Thanks, stuff. Thank you Great all. stuff. Thank you.